Good afternoon and welcome to uh, this afternoon's webinar, Design Data, BIM and Ship Information Management. Um, I'm your chair, Dan Roster, um, and hopefully you are as excited as I am to see and hear some great examples of how the kind of the ship industry is looking at information management BIM and the way that data gets managed. Uh, before we start the session, I just want to go through some quick housekeeping rules, if you don't mind. So as part of the way that we're doing it then, I just want to remind everyone that this webinar is being recorded. Uh, and the idea is that this is a listen only webinar. You will see on the side panel that you have the ability via the Q&A function to ask questions. Um, what we want to do is make sure that the session is interactive as possible and you are more than welcome to ask questions as we go through today's webinar. Um, so if you click on the Q&A button on the side panel and you should be able to post your questions. Um, questions that are um, easy enough to answer um, may get answered via text function through the webinar. However, there is a dedicated Q&A session we are doing at the end so that where there are questions where it may benefit letting everyone know the answers to them, um, we will talk through those questions then. Um, if you experience any technical difficulties, please submit um, those via the Q&A function and we will make sure those get addressed as we go through. If uh, certain questions aren't answered or things aren't fully addressed during the webinar, a FAQ sheet will be provided afterwards as part of our post webinar communications, um, which you will have access to after completing the feedback survey. Um, so hopefully that all sounds all right. Um, and as such, I think we should move swiftly on and look at who we have speaking for us today. So we have a, a mix of speakers. Uh, first, we've got John Martin um, presenting to us from Sam Osk Limited, uh, followed by Matthew Jensen um, from Fraserline, Jonathan Ridley from Solid University, and then jo um, Jorg, Jorg Piantino from YSA Design. So a good kind of mix of presentations and content, and hopefully you're all looking forward to it as much as I am. And without further ado, I will pass this on to John to kick, uh, to kick us off. John, over to you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is John Martin, and today I will briefly discuss data modeling for ships. Next slide, please. The topics I will be addressing are the problem with use of data in the shipyard, single source databases, data used for ships, and effective data modeling for ships. Next slide, please. To start with, I present a thought. We all know that effective data management will enhance productivity. But if we structure the data in the right way, we can digitally define a ship concisely and effectively. Next slide, please. So what is the problem? The problem is the creation, storage, and management of the high volumes of complex data used on the ship. Shipyards are organized in many functional areas, such as design, procurement, manufacturing, production, etc. We all know the classic problem. Data is transferred back and forth between departments, causing potential errors, duplication, and difficult version control. The common solution is to use a single source database in which all functional areas of the shipyard share common data. All departments create, store, and access data from the same database. This is a very successful and practical solution. Next slide, please. However, database systems are often modeled to suit the operation of functional divisions of the shipyard. This ensures continuity of company procedures, processes, and practices with minimum change. But there's two fundamental problems with this approach. Ship data is not based on functional department, 
and ship data and shipyard data coexist in the same database. And if they're not logically arranged, they can be difficult to separate. Next slide, please. So what do we need in a single source database? Well, we need information on what to build. We need information on what to build it with, and we need to know how to build it. If we use the three primary database data, data sets as the product breakdown, the building materials, and a work breakdown, we would have a very effective way to capture and manage shipbuilding data. If data is arranged in this way, the product breakdown structure defining the ship and its systems and components is cleanly separated from the shipyard data. Next slide, please. So what do I mean by ship data in a product breakdown? Well, four sets of information will comprehensively and uniquely define the ship. The general arrangement showing the compartment layout and major systems and equipment. Gantlins and structural steelwork details, such as the whole form, the shell expansion, the midship section, frame spacing, etc. PNID system diagrams to define the fluid systems and their equipment, connectivity, components, and instruments and electrical schematics to define the high and low voltage power systems, connectivity, and cabling. These four sets, these four subsets of data, along with the calculated specifications and performance, are the functional design of a ship. All other data created in the shipyard, shipyard exclusive. Next slide, please. To give an example of the type of data that's called shipyard data, if we look at the valves of this valve on the diesel oil system, the information the shipyard might record on the valve would be the pittance class from the shipyard pipework standards, the part number from the parts library, which would be different from the manufacturer's part number, a pipe isometric number, so they know how to orient the valve when it's been fitted to a pipe, a module number so they can plan when to fit it to the module or the unit or the ship, and other data such as the order number, the lead time, and the value of the cost. This data is not ship information and should not be in the product breakdown structure. It can be cross-referenced to the product breakdown structure using the unique instance number. Next slide, please. Other non-ship information used in the shipyard includes things like resource management, looking after the people and the equipment and the buildings and space uh, workspaces, uh, project control, procurement with contracts and invoices, finance with cost control, payroll, etc. Once again, this is not product data and should be not be in the product breakdown structure. Next slide, please. So what is a product breakdown structure? Well, a product breakdown structure is a hierarchical classification and grouping system that has fully defined the ship. Examples are the globally implemented SFI classification and coding system, which is used extensively across the industry. And also the weight group classification, which is used quite often in shipbuilding and typically used on naval ships. Groupment and classification systems use a three digit code for primary classification with a further three digits defining detail and material within each primary group. Next slide, please. Here we have an example in the SFI coding system with a primary group seven systems for machinery main components. It has a subgroup 744 exhaust gas systems and the six digit code is defined in the detail for equipment and components, such as silencers, spark arresters, which are associated with the exhaust gas subgroup. Next slide, please. Here we have an example of the wake grouping system shown the primary group one, which is hull and superstructure, which has a subgroup 120 main transversible CAS. And we see the six digit code defined in the detail of all the structural items such as plating, 
and stiffening used for the bulkhead. Next slide, please. Our second primary data set is the bill of materials. The bill of materials for a ship has two primary parts. The engineering bill of material will include all the material, equipment, components, and parts defined during design for the vessel. The manufacturing bill of material includes all components, parts, materials needed to build the ship. The e bomb is derived from the product breakdown, and the m bomb is derived from the work breakdown and can be arranged to match the build strategy. Next slide, please. Our third data set is the work breakdown structure. I've seen many papers and treaties on work breakdown structures that describe the work breakdown structure incorrectly as a product breakdown. I'll try and describe why I don't think this is feasible. It is well known and often discussed that ships are designed by system and built by block. The information included in a work breakdown to plan, design, manufacture, and build a ship in accordance with the build strategy is considerably more than needed to define the design of the ship. It is thus clear that a work breakdown system with a mix of ship and shipyard data is not an efficient alternative to a product, a product breakdown structure. Next slide, please. The type of information you might find in work breakdown structure would be definitions for work for things like analysis and design, planning and project management, craftsmanship, such as welding, shipwrights, platers, etc., fabrication, unit turning and lifting, and movement of blocks. Data and information for these activities is not product related and is shipyard exclusive. If two shipyards build the same ship, the work breakdown structure will be different to suit the facilities, capabilities, and resources of each yard. Next slide, please. So putting it all together, we have shown that the primary data subsets in the single source database could be the product breakdown to define the ship and what to be built, the bill of material to identify what to build it with, and the work breakdown to say how to build it. These data sets can be interfaced using the unique instance number as a reference key. Next slide, please. All of the data subsets required in the shipyard can be defined and interfaced with these three primary subsets to create a comprehensive single source shipyard database. With this data model, the product breakdown structure can easily be isolated from the remaining data subsets to give the ship owner and operator a clean data set of the ship definition and functional specifications without corruption from unnecessary shipyard data. Everything else is shipyard data and can be archived or deleted on handover of the ship. Next slide, please. Digital data is increasingly collected from instruments and controls to monitor and optimize the performance of a vessel and service. Fuel costs, emission control, operational efficiency, and equipment performance can all be monitored. This data can be managed within a product breakdown structure and associated with the correct systems, equipment, and instruments and their specifications and optimum op operational criteria. This enables the systems and indeed the ship performance to be measured and assessed continuously. The PBS is thus an important component of big data initiatives. Next slide, please. It may be noted that I've omitted the CAD models from the product breakdown structure. It is thought by many people that a CAD model must be included in the data impact provided to a ship owner on delivery. I disagree. CAD is a complex mathematical vector-based tool that is often tailored to suit the company using it. It is dependent on shipyard standards, processes, and libraries, and it needs highly skilled operators. Next slide. 
Here we see a simple rendered virtual reality visualization of the CAD engine converted from the CAD model. The visualization model is a simple polygon based representation of the ship design layout that is easy to use, effective, and does not depend on underlying processes and systems. It is highly unlikely that a CAD system can be used by ship owners or crews without considerable expenditure and system support and training. Visualization models are more useful and can be updated with scanned image models when necessary due to change. And as they are in a neutral form, are more likely to be readable with future computing technologies. Next slide, please. Visualization models enhance the general arrangement and can be utilized in many ways, such as the basis of augmented reality for clue training, maintenance, or install refit activities. This slide illustrates how AR might be used with a portable or perhaps wearable device, such as a tablet, to inform a worker which pipes that would be installed in a compartment during a build or a refit. Next slide, please. If we use visualization models as a crew training aid, then detail can be added using photographs attached to the surface of the visualization model. This gives the impression of considerable detail without affecting the size or fly through performance of the model and is a very useful technique in visualization. Next slide, please. So return to my first thought. I suggested that proven database technology and a well-defined data structure are required to achieve effective data management. I have proposed a data structure suitable for shipbuilding databases. I will now pass on to Matthew, who will discuss a database technology that is well-defined and successful in practical application. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Um, hello, everyone, and thank you very much for attending. Uh, my name is Matthew Jensen from Frasierline, and I'm going to be talking today about can BIM technologies work for cruise ships? Um, I'll probably be discussing a little bit more on the refit side of things and the passenger marine um, sector as a whole. Uh, next slide, please. So a little bit about us. Um, we started off in 2015 as a hospitality consultancy. Um, and from there, we've um, been working on a number of different uh, cruise ship projects. Next slide, please. And having an interest in marine, um, certainly been keeping a handle on what the future innovations are. Um, we see a lot of green innovation, uh, green energy innovations, zero emissions. That's a hot topic at the moment. Um, the ideas of autonomous shipping, uh, robotics on board. Um, during this COVID time, the idea of gesture control to replace uh, passenger touch points. Um, but one that's quite close to my heart is the idea of remote management and remote operations. Next slide, please. So I've broken this presentation up into four sections. Um, we'll start with reality capture, then moving on to BIM for Marine, um, then talking about the end users, and then finalizing on adopting BIM. Next slide, please. Now I include this slide, um, not in a marine context, but just in the AEC industry as a whole. Um, it relates pretty much to the architecture and engineering discipline, um, where the, whereby the past has been very much hand drawings, uh, manual data capture, so that's someone measuring with a ruler or uh, another means. Um, between the past and the present, we had the introduction of CAD, um, and then present now we see a lot of BIM, um, especially on land-based projects, and the idea of 3D laser scanning and reality capture is commonly used. Um, and then the future of generative design and Internet of Things. Um, so generative design being um, something upcoming now where we input the parameters and the information technology will provide the design outcome. So certainly an interesting future ahead. Next slide, please. So usually when carrying out a refit project um, on the design side of things, and this is probably a little bit more on the interior design side of things, um, it would require a manual investigation um, carried out on board. So that means visiting the ship. 
Um, and I've noted four issues um, with this uh, with this um, process. So one being the lack of accurate as-built data. Um, so that relates to John's um, term PBS. Uh, two being the lack of record keeping. Um, so that's uh, records on design and facilities management. Uh, the lack of defect and condition reporting. So that's if, for instance, when you go on board and you discover something doesn't work, such as a lighting system. Um, but number four being um, one that's quite important, in my opinion, which is low crew awareness of as-built data. So um, the instance where you may discuss with the crew um, and understand what data they hold about the ship on the bridge and find out that they have a very older version of the um, outfitting or um, and they may not have the latest information. So from a safety and emergency side of things, this, in my opinion, is quite an important thing to potentially address. Next slide, please. So I'll begin by talking about reality capture. Next slide, please. So the first method of reality capture is a typical uh, method um, when it comes to design teams looking at um, a refit of a cruise liner, for instance. Um, you would typically get past the owner's CAD um, if it's available. And whether that CAD information is correct, it usually means if there's a slight anomaly with that information, it means visiting the ship and carrying out a measured survey or checking it. Um, now, you may have access to the PBS um, depending on if the operator has it. Uh, shipyard data normally isn't available. Um, technical records are certainly um, good if, uh, if you want to check the condition and defect side of things. But as I go back to my point really is that it usually means going on board a ship and spending some time in the area of focus um, for the refit. Um, and that would mean carrying out an audit um, that would then provide um, a, an inventory document. Uh, next slide, please. But the next method of data capture, which is the kind of emerging idea, would be to take on board a 3D laser scanner. Now, this would very much create a point cloud um, 3D um, document or 3D file um, and would capture whatever area of focus it might be, the architecture, the interiors. It would capture um, a 3D inventory of fixtures, fittings and materials, whether that's externally or internally. Um, and it also would um, give a good understanding of materials um, finishes on board, as well as potentially any defects or condition reports as well. So it would be a one hit procedure on board um, that would th then be placed into the BIM environment. So a very useful tool and is pretty much the first node of adopting BIM. Next slide, please. So I'll now talk about BIM for Marine. Next slide, please. So what is BIM? Um, BIM stands for Building Information Modeling. And what are the benefits for marine? Well, it improves coordination, um, much like on land projects. Um, it has a visualization tool built into it, um, which is certainly useful for um, design. Uh, it works in a parametric method. So whatever you do in 3D, um, automatically updates in the 2D. Um, and it also means placing the specification data into the BIM environment. So there's no need for other software packages or any Excel spreadsheets with the specification. It is much like John said, it's a single source point of data. Um, and there are a number of other third party um, plugins or software um, that could talk to BIM potentially. And that's things like audit trail tracking, simulation, capacity analysis. And I mentioned earlier about generative design. Now, this is something that seems to be coming into BIM um, quite quickly now, where in a marine context, I can see generative design being assistive with classification societies um, and probably um, being a really good aid for SOLAS and IMO regulations. Next slide, please. So within the BIM uh, terminology, um, we hear this term common data environment quite frequently. Um, now, within a BIM, within a ship context, um, I would assume that we would be organizing elements on board of the outfit that's probably on the interior side in series of families where, for instance, you may have bulkhead types in one particular family, you may have fixtures and fittings in another. Um, and this would very much be the standard, um, standards for uh, the BIM environment, um, the CDE um, within a ship context. Now, this information outside of uh, the BIM design process um, could be um, adopted for the future use of asset information. So that may feed into a digital twin system or a building information, um, building ma management system for facilities management. So it's very much front loading that information at the beginning. Next slide, please. And this is just a typical look at um, how BIM 
could work um, or is interfaced within a marine context. So again, I mentioned you're, you're very much looking at a 3D model and everything you do is within that 3D context. Um, you can output the 2D data. So that's things like ship drawings, um, whether it's refit um, packages for the interiors or even um, some of the exterior stuff. Um, and what I like about it is it's very much uh, multidisciplinary with different consultants. So you can have the interior um, consultants on board, MEP structure, um, could be welcomed into uh, marine surveyors and naval architects. Um, and the good thing as well is the IFC and COBE data could potentially talk with a lot of naval um, design packages. So um, potentially a lot of uh, food for thought with this. Um, now, obviously, being building information modeling, um, there are some parts to BIM that aren't appropriate for the marine industry. But I think, you know, as a great design tool to um, take the benefits we have, um, it, it certainly has um, an aid to the future. Next slide, please. So I'll now talk about the end users. Next slide, please. So the ship data being formed by, say, BIM and 3D survey data, the point cloud, would be very much of interest to vessel owners because it would provide a, an as-built record of their asset. Um, I talked earlier about the crew, um, the use of crew having um, input into this um, information, so it could have a presence on the bridge. Um, and then I assume the ship data would then be managed by facilities management um, thereon. So, um, for instance, facilities managers may change a component or a part on board um, and would update the BIM information um, for, for, so that the as-built data remains live. Um, and the beauty of this is that um, with future modifications, the data can be readopted by engineers and designers, and then it kind of eliminates the um, reality capture process in the future. So certainly um, a lot more streamlined and efficient um, for, for any future refits. Uh, next slide, please. Digital twin, it's a, it's a word used a lot in um, the AEC industry. Um, I've put together this slide just showing you a, an example of a digital twin platform on a terminal on board a bridge. Um, now, I we have a sister company, startup company that um, is looking into the data integration of this particular um, system. Um, now, we see a, a use case where, for instance, the bridge the crew members, senior crew members may need to actually adopt and investigate this information, this 3D model, um, should there be required for safety or emergency procedures. Um, it gives members in the management of the, the crew management side of things. Uh, basically um, the, the updated um, asset information of the ship. So could be quite useful for, for the operations of the vessel as well. Next slide, please. There could be a use case where BIM can be placed into um, virtual sea trials and simulators. Uh, this is probably a little bit more on the new build side of things, but certainly would assist and aid with the naval design and the performance of the vessel at such an early stage of the, um, of, the, of the design process. Next slide, please. But I think the biggest um, topic of, of assistance is predictive maintenance. Now, we know within the cruise industry um, that it's very much zero downtime. Um, it's uh, scheduling has to be pretty much um, on the mark. And with this type of system, um, I foresee it being certainly an aid to helping with um, maintenance, scheduling and refit across the ship, which benefits um, the operations of the ship. It benefits the itinerary planning um, and it overall just helps with um, the consistency of facilities management across the vessel, um, but also um, helps with the brand um, passenger touch points being consistent across the vessel, which is better loyalty for the brand of the operator um, of the cruise ship as well. Next slide, please. I'll now um, finalise on adopting BIM. Next slide, please. So both routes, either on the new build or the refit revitalisation, um, will end up at the same place with the BIM um, format. Um, the only real difference is, is obviously with the new build, you're probably going to have the luxury of the CAD data from the naval architects, um, which may be able to be a little bit more in detail, a little bit more assistive, whereas the refit, um, maybe being a historic vessel, um, will require a lot more investigation and um, involvement with 3D laser scanning. So certainly um, both could end up at um, a very interesting um, end outcome. 
but uh, with the 3D laser scanning, obviously that's a, a quite a, an intricate and um, time saving, time invested process. Next slide, please. So how do we innovate the future of fleet management? Well, in answer to the question, does BIM work for cruise ships? The answer is yes. Um, but what do we need? Well, we need 3D reality capture for passenger marine, where we offer this as a business. Um, we need BIM for passenger marine, where we have started to work on um, BIM now for uh, standards for um, passenger marine. And as I said earlier, we have got a startup sister company looking at um, digital twin and BMS systems for data integration for the, for the life of that vessel. So quite an interesting future with um, how data lives with the vessel and acts essentially as a, a virtual O&M manual. Uh, next slide, please. So I re-referenced this slide, um, which is pretty much talking um, about the past, present, the future. I think whatever we do now in the present, whether that's really the adopting of BIM and 3D laser scanning, will affect the future. Um, we foresee generative design and internet things being quite a major force. So whatever we do now will certainly be assistive um, for a fully connected data set from the marine industry. Next slide, please. And then I conclude on this utopian slide where with the forces of Internet of Things, uh, Digital Twin, BIM potentially, um, we are looking at a much more connected ecosystem uh, data ready for the um, entire life of the asset. So the cruise industry potentially could be a much more connected and um, data friendly environment, um, meaning that we can conduct refits um, and better, better improve the vessels um, with the improvement of data being available. So um, certainly uh, very exciting times ahead. Next slide, please. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, here are my details. I will now pass you on to Jonathan Ridley uh, from Sirlent University. Oh, thank you very much, Matthew. Uh, hello, I'd like to talk briefly this afternoon about digital twinning, uh, which Matthew's already mentioned, uh, where we can make use of data from shipbuilders, naval architects and operators in order to create accurate simulations or digital twins of ships for a range of purposes. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, there's a, a famous quote here from, from Dr. Dyke for engineering, which is often said in jest, but perhaps is, is a little truer than we'd like to, to acknowledge. Uh, he tells us that engineering is the art of dealing with materials we do not wholly understand, shapes we cannot precisely analyse, forces we cannot probably assess, so that the community at large has no reason to suspect the extent of our ignorance. But I think there's, there's an element of truth to some of that, and whilst technology and processes in 1978 were clearly a lot more limited than today, uh, this quote perhaps helps to highlight the problem that we deal with in shipping. We still deal with materials that vary in properties, particularly under environmental degradation. We deal with extremely complex shapes, um, albeit, as Matthew shown us, that we can now very accurately measure and manufacture, but these shapes change in the environment that they're in due to wave action and due to loading. And we deal with very transient loads, especially from environmental conditions such as freak waves, that perhaps we still don't fully understand. And while there's a lot of data available, uh, the complexity of this situation means that it's difficult to know the, the accuracy of that data and its application. So there's still for a lot of, lot of unknowns in the data that we really don't understand. But we can do our best to try and put this together into a, a digital twin. So next slide, please. So this is our first bridge simulator for a ship located in a shipping container at Warsash in 1977. And as we can see from the clock, about 17 minutes past four. Uh, this was one of the first simulators in the world for shipping, and uh, maybe perhaps the, the original digital twin almost of a, a ship. And although quite a technical marvel at its time, as you can see, it's really not quite as advanced as you might expect. Uh, it could simulate up to six other ships at the time, um, at night only, and required a lot of manual intervention from the technical staff to get it to work, including holding up drawings of ships at the appropriate moment. Uh, but every, every technology has to start somewhere. So next slide, please. If we jump ahead to 2000, this is one of six of our bridge simulators today. Uh, they simulate operations, instrumentation, manoeuvring, control systems, and some of the underlying engineering, keeping the ship powered and moving, allowing us really to simulate an entire ship as a digital twin. Uh, next slide, please. 
So the simulators are primarily used for training merchant navy officers uh, to learn to navigate and manoeuvre ships and as part of their assessments. Uh, we use them for research projects as well. But from our perspective, the key use is as a digital twin and design tool. Um, this digital twinning can either take the form of modelling a vessel so that the crew can practice manoeuvring in an existing port. Uh, we can model new vessels so the crew can try and understand how they'll manoeuvre. Or we can model new vessels in new ports um, to allow crews to try and assess the impact of the combination of a new ship in a new port. Uh, this allows us to develop realistic exercises that can be used to both practice manoeuvres and to help and write and develop operating procedures, uh, for example, crosswind limits for risk assessments. This does, of course, though, very much depend on us being able to accurately uh, or uh, access accurate data and have suitable access to the data. Um, we've got clients for this digital twinning, which range from research vessels to, to passenger vessels and port authorities. Um, perhaps the most unusual vessel we ever modelled was Brunel's Great Eastern Paddle Steamer for, for Channel 4's time team a few years ago for a special they were doing. It's quite a challenge. Uh, next slide, please. So from the point of view of developing a model, there's, there's four key aspects to the digital twin model that rely on external data from, from third parties. Um, some of those that are highlighted in orange only really impact on the graphics, and that's still an important part of the experience, while the others impact on the, the manoeuvring model and the accuracy of the digital twin. So let's just have a, a look at each of them in turn. So next slide, please. So the external model is built from STL or OBJ meshes. They are a typical export from most CAD packages. So they would come directly from shipyards and, and naval architects. And as we've seen already, a little bit of debate about the CAD drawings and should they be supplied. Uh, sometimes some of our customers simply don't have CAD drawings and we need to, to build up a model for, from scratch. Uh, there's no guarantee that a ship owner will have access to their files or CAD models. And again, no guarantee that uh, a shipyard will hand them over even if they do. We overlay textures onto the model to give it a, a, a good appearance and a colour. Um, and while this may not be particularly important, the realism does help with the overall engagement for the user of the, the digital twin. We have to add in appropriate signal points, such as navigation lights and, and day marks in the, well, the correct positions, and then link those to the model so that they can be controlled from the bridge. And we need to put in place sensor locations, such as GPS aerials and radar scanner heads, to make sure that the, the data that they supply to the simulator is accurate for the position on the vessel. We then design custom control panels based around either standard instrumentation or with custom controls based on Python. Now, next slide, please. The next stage is to start to build the hydrodynamic model for the hull forces. Uh, this requires a huge amount of data and realistically, some of this data we need may not actually exist. Um, our starting point is a parent or a similar vessel and we have a database of 450 with, with known and good data uh, or one of 15 prototypes that we can start with. And we need 41 separate parameters to start to build our model, ranging from the size of the vessel in terms of its length and its beam and its draft through to dynamic conditions for, for high speed craft and aerodynamic conditions. So this all goes together to create the initial hydrodynamic model for the hull, which defines the forces acting on the hull at different speeds and different drifts. Uh, this can be really difficult to validate at full scale. Um, there's not many people prepared to let you borrow their, their VLCC for the day and tow it sideways to see how much force it creates. Um, so there's an element of, of qualitative and quantitative judgment. Next slide, please. So once we've got data about the hull and the forces that it will generate in air and water, we can start to look at the propulsion method. So we need to choose the correct propulsion type, either a, a fixed pitch propeller, for example, or a controllable pitch propeller. Well, that's easy enough. The, the, the shipyard will be able to tell us that information. But we also need information about the propulsor characteristics. So uh, the blade area ratio, the torque characteristics, the thrust characteristics. And again, this might be a, a level of detail that we need that the ship owner may not have in, in the detailed form. So again, we might have to go from, from some standard values. Um, so this all then goes together to work out effectively a balance of forces for our hull and our propulsion. Next slide, please. The next stage involves collecting and assembling as much data as we can about the engine, and it's, it's quite a complex mathematical model of the engine. Uh, we start off with the, the basic type, whether it's, for instance, a low speed diesel or a high speed diesel. And we have different mathematical models for each. Uh, we need to know the power output, particularly across different uh, operating conditions, any governor performance limitations. But we also need to know about the physics of the engine. So the inertia of the moving parts and the torque performance 
because that in itself interrelates with the, the thrusters and the propulsion to give us a, a particular driving force for the vessel. Uh, we also need to know how the controls interact and things like the response time to the, the throttle or the telegraph. Next slide, please. And then for controlling the rudder of uh, the vessel, finally, we need to know about the rudders and the control surfaces. So we need to know the rudder type, uh, for instance, a balanced rudder or a semi-suspended rudder. Again, normally fairly easy to get from a shipyard. We need to know about the size and aspect ratio, how much of the rudder is immersed at different loading conditions, the lift and drag data, um, the location and the, the distance from the rudder from the turning point of the vessel, which actually is quite complex and changes with speed. Um, so lots of information there to tell us how the vessel is going to respond to force, so the forces rather that will cause the vessel to respond in manoeuvring. Next slide, please. Well, once we put all that together, we have our model built, as you can see, on, on a huge amount of data. Um, we have to be realistic that there's varying accuracy of that data and, and confidence in the data. So to check for accuracy and to make sure it is correct, we run a series of virtual sea trials. Um, I don't do that on the, the simulator itself. I've got a PC software that, that does that for me. Um, I have full maneuvering control, just as I would on the bridge. And I can create an autopilot to run a series of commands for standard manoeuvres, so a Duodono spiral, for example, or a Kempf manoeuvre, uh, which I can then record the output from. Um, I can put in environmental data as well if, if I want to, but uh, the most important part is it gives me an output of all the forces in the data, which I can start to use to compare against information that we do have. And where possible, we can compare this to real sea trial data uh, or make qualitative judgments about the quality of the model. Um, there is always a question with sea trial data that sea trials taking part or taking place over a long period of time will have different environmental conditions, for instance, at the start and finish of the trial. So even sea trial data itself may have a degree of, of uncertainty within it. The next slide, please. For those of you who may be familiar with ship manoeuvring, there's an example of one of the manoeuvres, just a turning circle, where we can work out things like the advance and the tactical diameter. Uh, next, stop, so next slide, please. And here we've got some information for a trial we run for a, a crash stop. Um, this particular vessel is a controllable pitch propeller. Uh, we can see on the graphs here the pitch ratio, showing how the pitch is changing. The RPM, which we can see is changing in response to different thrust and torque characteristics of the propeller, and the speed of the vessel as she starts to slow down, as well as a plot showing the track of how she's moved sideways under the effect of the propeller. The next slide, please. And as I've mentioned quite a lot, the, the accuracy of our simulation and our digital twin is only as good as the data we have. Um, and there are lots of methods of predicting maneuvering performance with varying results. Uh, these charts here show some predictive results for a particular vessel uh, in two different maneuvers with a number of different codes and universities. And we can see the variation in results. There's quite a, quite a significant spread. So real-time data from similar ships or sister ships, real operational data is therefore really important and valuable to us in enhancing the accuracy. So whenever a client comes along to us, and they have some real ship data for a similar vessel, it's very useful in, in tuning the, our, our digital twin to work. Um, so we can take virtual sea trial data, we can match it to real data uh, to ensure as much accuracy as we can, and we can tune it accordingly. So next slide, please. So in terms of accuracy and to, to measure accuracy, we can really look at this in terms of, of three aspects. The first one is fidelity. So does the simulation feel correct to the user? Is it a, a suitable level of realism? Um, the, the graphics themselves mathematically are not really important to us, but actually, as John mentioned, for visualizations and so on, they are important and it does help the, the overall feel of the simulation. Then we need to look at verification. Does the mathematical model actually operate as intended? Do the controls and systems run as expected? If I go from zero throttle to 100% throttle, does the engine respond as I would expect? Uh, is this, this vast amount of data that we've entered actually correct? Um, and then we look at the simulation validation itself. Are the results the same as in the real world? Is the data correct in the first place? Uh, quite often it comes down to putting one of the captains on the bridge simulator and asking them to drive the digital twin and to give us feedback as to how they feel it maneuvers in comparison to, to a similar ship. So ensuring the accuracy is, is a bit tricky, but operational data can, can really help us to validate aspects of the model and to make it as accurate as possible. Uh, next slide, please. And if we really want to, we can use large scale models, uh, though this is certainly not a cheap process to be able to, in theory, to understand a bit more about the, the performance of the vessel. Um, this is uh, our lake at Timsbury in Hampshire, where we, we train pilots to manoeuvre ships using these, these large models 
which we could instrument and, and use effectively as a large scale laboratory. Uh, interestingly, from the point of view of, of data and data management, we're currently working on a project called Ignite, which is funded by Baratime UK, where we're actually linking one of our bridge simulators to one of these models, so you'll be able to drive the model real time from the ship simulator uh, as a test bed for autonomous control systems. And part of this is looking at the, the data transfer and data handling. So next slide, please. So really, just to summarise, we've got these, these stages of the process of preparing the model, testing the model, tuning the digital twin to match the real ship if we can, or to get it as close to theoretical predictions as we can, finalising it, making sure we're happy with it mathematically, getting feedback from the operators, making sure they feel that it manoeuvres, and then perhaps using that as the starting point for another iterative circle. But all of this depends on getting as much data as we can of the highest possible quality. Um, as with any, any mathematical process, any simulation process, the quality of the output is only ever as good as the quality of the input. So next slide, please. So here's just a, an image to, to close my, my part of the presentation with of a, one of our simulators entering Portsmouth Harbour on a nice sunny summer's evening. Um, hopefully something we'll be able to do and, and perhaps show you anybody who's interested around our simulation centre once the COVID crisis has passed. So thank you very much for listening and I'll pass on now to Georg. Hello everyone, friends and colleagues. We are attending this webinar from our lovely office in uh, Oslo. It's sunny and nice. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you to BSI for inviting us to talk short about such an important topic in the maritime industry. Um, very nice input from you guys, Dan, John and Jonathan. Um, we can start with the first slide. We are now um, presenting very short, no, go one back, please. <laughs> we are now um, uh, presenting very short uh, how we as architects and designers in our office working and using BIM as a communication tool between outfitters, the yard and the architects. Um, next page, please. So this is uh, a cut out of our BIM manual. We have in our office um, uh, worked long, long time with land-based projects, where we are, where it's mandatory in the Norwegian for the Norwegian government to use building information model BIM. We took over all this land-based experience and transformed it into the maritime industry. So we became now the pioneer design and architect office, which used fully BIM in their projects. Um, what does this mean? That together with the shipyard, the owners and the outfitters, we have built and are building today uh, around 5,000 passengers cruise ship in fully 3D and BIM. So this slide actually is out, cut out of we are making building information modeling manuals where we make the guidelines how to communicate between the different parts. Um, on the right side um, we have the yard with their subcontractors and on the left side we have the designers and the lead architects. What's the important thing for us and what we are now working on or what we're working is that the communication every part is working maybe with a different uh, program but at the end we are making a common file where we are gluing together the architects and designer models with the shipyard model so in the ideal world now as you guys mentioned before it's not often that you get from the shipyard all the informations they're still keeping them for themselves, but in an in a ideal world, <laughs> maritime world, it, is, it would be very good if we have all the information from the yard and then we glue it together with our design. That keeps us to work easier and uh, I will come further on the next page, please. Now we'll very shortly tell how we in-house uh, work uh, with the different um, people. We have architects, we have interior architects, and we have 
uh, 3D and render expert. We have BIM CAD operators, we have BIM manager and product managers. So already by the general arrangement, the first step on the right side, we are one of the leading architects who have the knowledge to make general arrangement plans and technical solutions. We do this, and you can see this on the net, on the on, on the further pages. We do this on sketching, but also making on quick 3D models. We support BIM knowledge to different parts, um, designers, or to the shipyard. We use um, active our VR um, uh, equipment. Concept study will be made in 3D. Technical drawings, material specification like. Uh, we mentioned before, now we are really getting close to work on one program for all these topics, what is listed out here. Renderings and at the end, high-end presentation. And for all this, we are using full 3D program with BIM. Next page, please. So how are we doing this inside with the different phases so we have four different phases in our office we have the concept phase where we working together with the owner we are building making sketches we are building quick models we 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 work together with them when we start with the drawing drawing production we are going over including the yard the yard supports us with their ga and uh, with their maybe CAPIA model or a 3D model, then we are gluing this together with our CAD operator, operators. And uh, when we have done that, then we go into the next step, material specification. This is um, uh, where we are tagging all the elements with the right materials, where we get the information like it's important for the owners and also for the people who are outfitting them. It uh, has something with cost, with weight, with size, and with the guy who is um, uh, producing them. So, And then the fourth phase is our visualization and presentation phase, where we only work together with the owners again. We use the model, uh, freshen it up, and, and, and run through it with our VR equipment or we also use it only for pre presentation purpose. Now, I really quick, next page please, want to go into our working process. As you can see, this is uh, the first phase, the sketch phase, where we laying out the GA. There we make already 3D modelings, what we are sharing, as I said before, in the first phase we are sharing with the owners where we can walk through the areas with our VR equipment or on the screen. Next page, please. Then we go over into the um, drawing, drawing phase, uh, drawing production. Um, uh, the, the special area will be built in 3D. We get supported from outfitters. We uh, are very often on uh, uh, cruise fairs and there are the outfitters coming and say, how can we be part of the project? And I always say, please uh, give us 3D modelings because then we can include it into our uh, BIM model because we get all the informations there. And this is very useful when we are reviewing areas. So. Then on the right side, you have the material phase where we're tagging every material with, with the right, with the, with their, uh, where we're tagging every um, object with the right material. And this is only a mouse click away then with our program for getting a whole material specification for reviewing, for sending out. So we use one program, more or less. Um, then we are going the next phase is then where we review the areas next page please so then we are making um uh we are exporting it to an endscape or to uh, um, um, uh, uh, revit 360 glue program where we can um, review um, and inspect all the, um, the complex areas. And while we are doing that, we can share these files with our 
um, with the client and we can walk through together on the screen or somebody uses a VR equipment to go through the areas. We can tack on all materials, we can get the information what we want, we can mark it there together where we can see here on the right hand side maybe it's uh, the sliding door is too high, it's too low, we should do some changes, we can mark it, we can send it directly, we have a screen sharing technology, we can send it directly to the responsible person and this is a quick and uh, uh, um, easy communication between all parts and then like you said that the shipyard is not often sharing their steel drawings. I hope in the future that this one will be not an issue anymore because it's very important on the right hand side on the top you can see where the shipyard is sharing without their steel drawing in red and we build the architecture around and if this communication runs smoother then the process will be uh, even more simpler and better. Um, then the, the next step is the uh, rendering and presentation. Please, next page. Then we are using the, the, the finished 3D model where all the materials are uh, tech accurate from the outfitters and from the material specification. Then we are easily can make 3D renderings and, and drawings for presentation and or we can use them to inspect these areas where we walk again less, as i said we export it we send it to the we send it to the responsible person we are making vtc meetings where we um, go with them walk through together with them and make the adjustment what's necessary so after we are leading this uh, big um, um, BIM uh, in the design, design-wise, after the COVID-19 pandemic outbreak, we figured out that the BIM, uh, the building information modeling helps also actually to have a better communication where traveling is not an issue. So we are next page, please. We together with the sh with the client, we made like a cutting edge collaboration um, where we, like I said now before, where we went, where we are going through these five steps, where we um, uh, share on the kickoff uh, sessions. We are going through all the programs we are using, and we have also the screen sharing technology. Um, then we, together with the with the owner, we are making a BIM manual. This is the, mo the most part when, where, and how we are sharing, combining this, uh, gluing together these um, um, files from each part, because this helps us to work quicker and go uh, further in the process very very quick. Then we use. The step three is where we use um, um, VR goggles, or we also can use a screen, only the screen, where we walk together on the same area together with all the parts when they are sitting in other countries, or um, so that we it's easy to communicate. Uh, at the end, uh, at step four, we then send out Enscape files where we where clients can review the areas and then we are agreeing on a weekly conference call where we together uh, define the process further so thank you very much this was my little input from how we as a designer use BIM as a communication tool thank you fab thank you everyone um, I guess in particular from my point of view, uh, what I found quite striking was the similarities. Knowing nothing about ship and shipyard modeling uh, before this event, 
I think seeing things like the product breakdown structure and stuff from John, as well as then how a lot of the, the software and stuff is being used, I can see a surprising number of parallels, which you know, reinforces why we had this webinar in the first place, but I think it was quite surprising for me. I think um, we did ask you to submit questions and there are a fair few questions. And I think thankfully um, there are some quite similar questions as well. Um, so I will delay no further and go straight into the first one. Um, three or four different um, attendees have, have asked a very similar question, uh, which we will address to everyone. Um, which ultimately is that through a number of these presentations, things like um, Revit and stuff was shown and a number of questions have come in asking about what are the CAD and kind of modeling softwares that are typically used in the production of ship and shipyard information um, that normally get used to what are sort of the, the more popular products. Uh, I guess I'll just say that any products that get named, uh, I expect aren't endorsements, but are just references to products in the industry. Uh, a number of people are calling for what examples of software people might use to start to build and produce this information. So I don't know who would like to jump in first. If there are no volunteers, then I'll say, John, why did you start us off? Yeah, I can... <laughs> Anyone? Please, John, go ahead. Sorry, sorry, sorry I'm sorry. On the CAD situation, there's um, many CAD systems used in shipbuilding across the world. There's CAD systems that have been developed for shipbuilding from the 1960s, such as Foran and uh, Aviva, which are, are well used. There's um, PTC with its modifications, there's Katia. There's uh, CADmatic and uh, there's lots of other CAD systems. So the CAD systems are not consistent and only one copy across the world. They're all very different and very differently used, I would suggest. And it's uh, very rare for a CAD system used in shipbuilding to be used straight out of the box. They mostly have some modifications to suit the shipyard that's wanting to use it, the, ship, the shipyard processes and practices. So they're not consistent between shipyards. No, that's great. Thank you, John. Does anyone want to add some other examples of software into that or um, try to contextualize how the tools like Revit and stuff have come in aside things like Katia and some of the other softwares that John just mentioned then? I can, I don't know if, uh, I else wanted to sort of uh, point, but uh, I, I was going to suggest, and again, no endorsement, of course, um, that uh, Revit is obviously a very commonly used BIM product. Um, but I think it all depends on um, what the design company or the um, architects or the engineers feel comfortable with. I mean, some have better um, creative um, attributes, uh, whereas some don't. And I think when it comes to looking at the cruise line industry and, and pushing the boundaries of design now that we see on board with passenger amenities and leisure facilities, I think obviously it depends on what you are offering to your client as a design concept. If you want obviously very organic design, then you need to think about that when, when considering a BIM package. Um, so that's my only thing I would say um, on that BIM, you know, some are quite restrictive with the design, um, capabilities, which means you have to bring in then another software package for 3D modeling and then coordinate it all, which can be um, a, a little bit more um, time demanding. But certainly that is probably my biggest um, consideration when you're thinking about a BIM package. No, um, with CAD packages, one of the things that's important about CAD packages for shipbuilding is that the CAD package needs to manage the complex shape of the ship hull and its internals as well as the uh, the layout for pipes and equipment and that makes it different to quite a lot of systems which are used for places like power stations and um, and oil, oil rigs and that sort of thing which are all straight line pipes and, and things so it, it can, does have some complications with trying to manage the uh, the complexity of uh, ship hull forms and unusual shapes. Oh, that's great. Thank you, John. And that helps us lead into another question uh, which came through, which was 
more or less on that topic, which was if someone's using some of these more um, generic CAD packages with all their straight lines and everything, you can use uh, off the shelf products and, and systems to sort of assemble that, that information. But you know, obviously there need to be a mix of using uh, bespoke products. And in particular, I think I can only imagine in kind of in this kind of marine environment, there are a lot more kind of bespoke products that need to be modeled and represented. And then that's where I assume things like Katia, Inventor, and so sort of, some of those products start to come into this. Um, but what I wanted to ask about is that how is then the use of those different tools managed in that you might have in the sound space a piece of software that manages the the development of the information at the macro level where you've got the, the entire ship or shipyard and then you've also got a lot of these different and what seems to be um customized products that are then dealing with um bespoke products or systems so how how do we ensure that the the information between those different solutions actually can marry together. And I guess, uh, I think based on the presentation stuff, I don't know, Matthew, if you wanted to jump in on this first. I think it's a very good question, Dan. I mean, yeah, it's, it's. I mean, you know, obviously horses for courses with software, you'll, you'll, you'll certainly come across many different industry um, consultants that will have their preference. So, you know, a surveyor might have one particular system and, um, outfitters might work in SolidWorks, for instance, which is widely known in the product in the industrial design market, and that obviously is used as well in the aviation um, design market. So, I, I, again, it, it, yeah, it's, I mean, it is always a common problem with trying to marry up um, software and output models and, and all trying to sort of tie it all together. It's, it's, it can be a nightmare, to be honest with you. But at the same time, if you have one single um, I mean, that's probably where the BIM is probably the most successful is that if you have one single um, interface and you have a number of different consultants that have access to that interface, it does certainly help um, with them either coordinating their model into yours or updating their model in the background and then sharing the information that way. I know the other the other one is that we've come across before is is things like car simulation, where for instance. Um, we've shared the BIM model for um, evacuation and capacity analysis um, to model and simulate movement around the ship, um, for instance, an evacuation procedure being an example. Um, and that is just literally taking the surface model from BIM. No other data is required. It's just literally taking that surface data and placing it into um, another third party software. So it can be, I mean, it'd be nice if we could get to a standard where we all talk together. Um, but I don't know whether we're quite there yet, but hopefully the future will. I can uh, support here a little bit and give a, in our input. Yes, please. Go. So the thing is, uh, this is why we are making the building information modeling manual, because uh, there is a standard and all the CUT programs can transport their model into IFC, all the 3D designing programs are working where you, this is an international um, file, what can work together with all 3D models. So if the, this is what we are doing when we are making a BIM manual, is that we are agreeing that we are filing IFC files from the shipyard, from the outfitters, from the designers, and glue them together with the Revit 360 glue. This is an add-on to Revit, and it's easy to combine. So it's already existing. It only needs to be written out accurately in the uh, BIM manual. Thank you. No, that's correct. And um, this is, it, we're getting um, we're delving quite deep into this one area. So what I'll do is I will I will come back to the to the IFC bit in a second. Uh, but just to make sure that we don't fall down the, the technical rabbit hole, uh, and there were some questions in some other areas. And I think actually, Jonathan, on your side, um, there were um, there's a question or two around um, modeling and some simulation bits, and whether this is in the the purview of your of your simulations, we'll find out. But there were some questions about ship evacuation modeling, and whether there was any simulation work done around. Um, your know, evacuation of, of persons and whether that's something that you guys uh, look into. 
Um, it is, yeah. It's not actually something that we do with our simulators. We're more more concentrating on the operational aspects from the bridge. Uh, we could simulate the the management aspects of an emergency. We can switch off different systems. We can start to start virtual fires in different places. Um, but the yes, the evacuation times for a ship are really important, uh, and they are set out in requirements for different ships to be able to evacuate at a particular speed. So uh, it's, it's not quite my specialist area for the the human factor of, of people on ships, but my understanding is that, that um, software is used in a very similar way to building modelling to look at the number of people that can move along particular evacuation routes at certain times to be able to work out just how fast you can get all of your passengers, your crew from their normal accommodation areas to their muster stations and then into the lifeboats and safely away from the vessel. No, that's great. Thank you. Um, just in evacuation, there's, there's uh, quite a few studies have been done on, on ship evacuation um, on both um, commercial ships and on passenger ships. And a lot of studies with universities and companies, a lot of papers have been presented, written over the years. And there was an excellent uh, um, evacuation procedure developed by Bob Cox that built the QE, the Queen Elizabeth's aircraft carriers to evacuate the building, the ship as it was being built, which is which is very clever. So there's a lot of work going on evacuation, and they look at things like um, a mum losing the kids going in the wrong way when there were people are trying to get off, they're trying to go on to get the to find who they've lost and things like that. So the, there's a quite a lot of studies in that area and a lot of papers. And I get involved with the International Conference on Computer Computer applications and shipbuilding where there's uh, every two years there's usually a paper or two presented on evacuation it's quite a um uh, a well studied uh, process and uh, worth reading some of the papers no that's good to know john thank you i think just with five minutes to go um i'll just jump us on to one final question and then what i'll just remind everyone about is that there is going to be an faq sheet afterwards so if your question has come up and you don't feel it's been answered it should appear in the faq sheet but i think one or two people have mentioned i think it's worth making sure we capture this on the call that at least two of the presentations referenced how there's a difficulty getting structural information from the shipyards um and you know and and that actually causes issues when trying to um collate the information together so that people can do effective and proper modeling so i just wanted to ask from you guys why do you think there's a reluctance to share this information um what's holding the industry back and actually what positive change could be made so that shipyards are more readily willing to share that information and this will be our final question for the webinar I think there's, um, if I can jump on this one, there's probably a, a quite a few reasons. Um, some of those, to be honest, are probably you know, deep in the complexity of intellectual property and ownership as to whether a shipyard sells the design of a vessel and the vessel to a shipping company, or whether the design is owned by the shipyard and then sold to the company. Uh, and both models could work in shipbuilding. So uh, it could be from the point of view of a shipyard that they would wish to, to protect their intellectual property to a certain extent. No, that's fine. But thank you, Jonathan. Is there anything else anyone wants to add to that? No, that's fine. In which case, sorry, you go ahead, John. Yes, sorry, um, I don't quite fully understand the question. The structural information on the ship, things like the hull form and the um, and the scantlings, that's the size of the steelwork and all that, is uh, is usually designed for each ship and worked off through the classification societies. Uh, and worked up, and I don't know what kind of information people are seeking. It's not usual, unusual to get a whole form. I would accept, I would expect, um, but they they don't need the details or the or the classification or the cal calculations if they're just doing visualization work. So it depends what they need to use the information for. And I quite agree that some of it will be proprietary information and quite uh, quite sensitive if 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 uh, shipyard designs. Uh, a new ship was uh, you know, better performance, uh, fuel burning performance, et cetera, because of the whole form, then they just want to share that when it's got an advantage over the shipyard. So there's, uh, it, it, it just depends on the amount of information sought by the third party about how much will be given, which, which is the same with any IPR topic. Yes, and I think that you know, this is conjecture from my side, but in the early days of us looking at um, sharing this sort of information in the built environment, 
there were lots of questions around IP and the amount of detail that went into the objects used in the software um, because there were and there was a mix of some of it was misunderstanding thinking that you almost your you you create a very complex object full of all your trade secrets that then someone could just download and access to um, IP or the amount of actually work and effort that went in creating that complex model if someone could just take it use it and then um, work as a competitor um, but no, thank you. So um, with us getting to the last final minutes, what I would like to do is just to thank everyone for attending. Thank you very much and put a thank you out to each of our speakers and to say that actually there's been a very interesting comment that's just come through about whether BIM might help in fleet management. So not only are we exploring other sectors such as within ships and shipyards, but it is sparking the idea of where else building information modeling might also support within industry. So thank you very much for um, taking time out of your days to attend and thank you very much to our speakers who came along and presented. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed the session and um, as answered in the questions, copies of presentations and the frequently asked question sheet should be made available after the presentation. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>